Camille Dotson disappeared in Las Vegas in September of 1994. She was 30 years old at the time of her disappearance. Camille is described as a white woman with hazel brown eyes and brown hair, which she sometimes lightened. She stood at 5'7 and had a tattoo on her hip that reads Cruise. Camille weighed between 125 and 145 pounds with an athletic build. She had a recently broken nose and slightly discolored teeth, and she was known to smoke Marlboro cigarettes. Additionally, she may have used the first names Nicole, Renee, or Kim, and the last names Clark or Diaz. On September 3, 1994, Camille was last seen walking on the 300 block of South Casino Boulevard in Las Vegas after leaving the Clark County Detention Center on foot. This was the last confirmed sighting of her. Camille moved to Vegas as a single mom to escape an abusive marriage. She faced trauma, financial struggles, and difficult circumstances that led her to engage in survival sex work. At her lowest point, she battled homelessness and addiction. Her daughter Ashley, whom I spoke to for this episode, and a group of friends are determined to retrace her final years in Vegas to find answers and justice. For the latest updates on Camille's case, please visit the Facebook page and website linked in the show notes. Ashley and her team are still searching for anyone who knew her during her time in Vegas between 1991 and 1994. If you recognize her, please contact them through the website or Facebook page. Any recollections you may have about her and her life would be helpful, no matter how small. If you have any information about the disappearance of Camille Dotson, please call the Las Vegas Metro Police Department at 702-828-3111. How old were you when your mom went missing? Like, what do you remember? I mean, I imagine it's it's probably a little hazy given how young you were, but can you fill me in kind of on like what you remember and how old you were and what you can kind of retain in your mind from, from those circumstances of what happened to your mom? So I was seven and my grandma and I, which is my mom's mom, um, my grandma had decided she wanted to move back to Chicago from Vegas. So we drove cross country um, to Chicago and we were living with my grandpa um, and he lived in uh, Marina Towers, which is the two twin towers that look like honeycombs. And um, so we were watching a movie and my mom called and she talked to my grandma for a little bit and then I talked to her and I remember being annoyed because I was watching a movie and my mom said, um, be a good girl for Nana. And like in hindsight, I look back on it and it sounded like a goodbye, but in my mind, it was just like, all right, yeah, fine. Let me watch this movie. Um, and we lived in Chicago for a couple months and then we moved back to Las Vegas and we drove cross country again. And then when we got back, she was gone. And that's basically like the memory of it. All of a sudden we were searching for her, but there was no like seeing her again and then her disappearing. Like when we came back from Chicago, she was gone. So she stayed in Vegas while you went to Chicago. What was she doing in Vegas while you were in Chicago? It sounds like she was working. She was a sex worker and stripper. Um, I don't know if that terminology is correct. Uh, exotic dancer, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I mean, she wasn't supporting me. She was supporting her drug habit. Uh, but yeah, that, that was her her jobs. And from, according to police records, she was also, like, selling drugs, um, like, out her apartment window, kind of like a drive through So she was involved in kind of the underbelly, CD kind of version of Vegas, it sounds like. Is that kind of a fair description? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Before we kind of get into that and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance, for those who never have met your mom, like how would you describe her, you know, wh- whether it's, you know, quirks about her personality or physical appearance, like I'll obviously share photos too uh, for the episode, but I'm curious to hear how you would describe your mom in your own words. So the problem with like traumatic um, past is like my, my brain works in like 
Snapchat. And most of my memories of my mom are, are not the greatest. Um, but I remember how much she loved me. And I remember just wanting to see her all the time and crying for her. And when I would see her just running to her and she had the biggest smile and, um, she was gorgeous. And I mean, to this day, people tell me how gorgeous she is and, oh, you look so much like your mom, which to me is like a huge compliment. So, um, I just think she's stunning. And I think that's something that if someone were to see her, um, they would be like, dang, she's real pretty. Um, but she had a huge smile too and big, pretty teeth. So she's she's working in Vegas, dancing in the summer and the fall of 94. I think, you know, you said she goes missing in September of 94. Is that approximate? Like, do you have a, a time and date or is it kind of just like you have a loose time period of when she disappeared? So it was in like September 6th. I believe that she was released from Clark County Detention Center. And then I think her arraignment was on September 26th. September 26th, I believe. My dates are a little wonky. I'd have to look into it a little further. But September 6th, she was released from jail and she was last seen walking away from the jail. And then um, she never showed up to her arraignment. And she's always been known to never miss a court date. So we believe that her date of disappearance is between that last date she was seen leaving the jail to her missed arraignment. So it's like a two or three week time period. So was she, I mean, I'm assuming it was something related to drugs. Like, was that what she was kind of being, what she was released for and had been picked up for? Yeah. So that, that whole situation is sketchy too. Um, Neighbors heard her screaming. Um, well, they heard a girl screaming in the apartment. And so they, they called the cops and the cops showed up and um, she's crying. And um, they see um, like a brick or something of drugs and it says for Kaiko. And that was the guy that she was arrested along with and that she was like staying with. But they say in Spanish, for Kaiko, and they arrested her for it. And then they they release her, and then she has she's going to have her arraignment at the end of the month. She goes missing. When I read this, I don't usually interject on my own theories, but part of me thought, and then I think you mentioned this in, in the website and the write up to your mom's case, but it seems like a plausible theory is that perhaps because of being picked up by the police and being being arrested for being involved in drugs, like maybe your mom decided to cooperate with the police, and that didn't sit well with people she was dealing with like can you tell me a little bit about that is that something you've looked into is that a plausible theory it just it seems like it would be a logical connection to maybe go there given the circumstances when she goes missing uh we do believe that she was some kind of informant but not at that particular i mean it's it's possible but we don't think it was like right then um because when we went through her like rolodex there was a name it said Dimitri, and when someone called it, it was uh, straight to the FBI. So we think she was a higher up informant of some sort. But I mean, it's completely possible that she did decide to cooperate. And from what I've heard about my mom, she had a big mouth. So if she would have said to the wrong person, "I'm cooperating" or something like, she could have been a goner. What else was going on in her life at the time? I know I read online she um, had a boyfriend. Like, can you kind of paint us a picture of like what else she has going on besides, um, you know, dealing with with drugs and and perhaps the police? Like, what's her personal life like? I really don't know, and anyone that would know is not here anymore. I just know that she was married to Cruz. Cruz was extremely violent, volatile, abusive, horrible, monstrous. I, I don't know if they were separated or what, but she was staying with Keiko, um, who is also known to be all of the same adjectives that I just use on Cruz. Um, she did not surround herself by upstanding people or even nice people. Yeah, that was a theme I picked up on reading about this case and your mom. And then you, I think you pointed out on the website as well that, you know, there's a lot of different people that potentially could have been involved in some respect, whether it was, you know, her estranged husband who you just mentioned, uh, the person she was staying with, 
maybe uh, obsessed regulars at the club, mobsters, etc. Given all the research and investigating you've done, are, do you lean towards your mom's disappearance involving something to do with her informing? Is that kind of where you sit? Or do you think there's maybe other people involved for different reasons? My whole life, I thought it was Cruz. And I don't know how far I can go into this without, like, defamation. It's just my own personal opinion. But my whole life, I thought it was Cruz because I witnessed his abuse firsthand. And then um, when I was older, I found out he was in prison for attempted murder. And But then I, I found out about Keiko when uh, my friend and I deep dove into police records. And I had never heard of Keiko um, but reading his history and even the abuse he continues to cause on other women today, I think it, it could be him too. So I, I I think there's a high chance that it's one of the two of them. And it sounds like there's a very strong chance that everything is kind of maybe interlinked in some way, um, just given what your mom was up to and kind of the world she was involved in. So how do you, I mean, you're seven when, when she goes missing and then you move back to Vegas, like... How do you grow up? What are people telling you about your mom? And then when do you decide that, you know, the police aren't doing anything, no one's looking for her, you're going to do that? Like, can you walk me through that process and and how you came to, you know, to want to, like, find out what ultimately happened to her? So I was really young, obviously, at seven. And I don't think my brain fully comprehended what exactly was happening. Um, It was just like my mom was in and out. I stayed with my grandma all the time. So her being gone for an extended time period, it wasn't much um, of a difference, I guess. Um, But my grandma almost immediately put me into therapy. So I was in therapy pretty much my whole life. Um, But I would go through like spurts where I would want to look into her case more and try to find answers, but I would get sidetracked and daily life would take over and I'd stop. And then I'd start again. And then like, I'd stop for another year or six months. Um, it wasn't until the, the true crime, like podcast, TV shows, all of that became more into the spotlight that it, it, it kind of became a little more known. So um, my my friend had emailed one of her favorite podcasts uh, a, a story suggestion using my mom. And my friend told me about it and asked if it was okay, which, of course, I said absolutely. And she forwarded me the email that she had sent the podcast. And at the bottom of the podcast, I or at the bottom of the email, I had noticed that um, there was a, a Reddit article that I had never read before. And usually, I would Google my mom's name every six months or so to see if anything new popped up. And this was something that I hadn't seen before. So I read it and it was very thoroughly written and um, it was great. And I read, I, I commented on that Reddit and just thanked the person for their time and effort in, in writing this and for giving my mom a voice. And she commented back and we just kept talking and she wanted to deep dive into this with me. And so that was in 2017 and she's the one that has like lit a fire under this and has gotten, she's pulled the police report, reached out to YouTubers and podcasts and TV shows and all of it. And it's, it's really taken off. So it's, it's been, I mean, I've been on the news a couple times uh, in Las Vegas for this, and there's been a few podcasts and a few YouTubes, but like every time that there's a new podcast or YouTube or news thing done, um, it's like the cops start working on it again for a little bit, and it's it's great. I mean, especially with the the true crime community, it seems like they're sometimes they're better at at doing cops jobs than the cops are because they, they have a passion for it. That's really, really fascinating. And I think it's a good segue into talking about the police and what your dealing has been like with them. I know we talked about it before I started recording, but I'm curious 
I guess when you started looking into this back in 2017, like, have you had a lot of dealings with the Las Vegas police? Um, do you know the extent of how much they're investigating your mom's disappearance? Um, you know, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, I don't really know much of anything. They don't really answer the phone. They don't answer emails. Um, for a little bit, the one detective that was on the case, he would respond, but not very often. Um, and my friend that I had met off Reddit, uh, Gabby, she would reach out to the police and say, hey, um, Keiko's in custody right now. Can you guys go interview him, please? And at one point they did, but they're like, oh, no, we don't think he's a suspect. But back in early 2000s, they were highly leaning towards him. So it's like, what's going on? But um no, there's not much dealing with the police. And um, in my last um, interview with uh, the news in Las Vegas, uh, they wanted to speak with me to follow up because the cold case unit was like expanding and they were going to deep dive into some of their older ones because they had just solved a 30-year-old um, murder that was unsolved. And I mean, there's been nothing from them. And this this September will be 30 years since my mom was last seen. That was actually my next question was, um, you know, I noticed that it is going to be 30 years in September. Are you hopeful that, uh, you know, for, from my experience, there tends to be more media coverage around anniversaries of disappearances, which is, you know, it's a good thing, but it's also disappointing that that's the, you know, it have, there has to be a kind of a marker for people to, to want to promote and, and bring awareness. But that said, 30 is a long time. It's a, it's a, I think it's a big, uh, a big number as well. Are you hoping that it's going to renew interest in your mom's case from both the public and the police? Like, how are you feeling about that? I mean, one can only hope. I don't really have any faith in Las Vegas Metro. They... I mean, at one point they told me that they can't release information because it's an open case, but then they're not actively working on it. Um, I just want answers. And I mean, this case is 30 years old and it, it's, they, there's been so many mistakes at their hands, um, like from the first missing persons report and saying that it was, they deleted it saying it was unfounded that they don't believe that she could be missing and she's not in danger. And then when it was redone in the early two thousands and they're like, "Uh Oh, she is endangered. Like that should have never happened. And for them to write it down, Hey, this person went missing in May of 94, but then they had her in custody in September of 94. I don't feel like it's that hard to record keep and be able to see, like, run her name and see, oh, wait, we had her in custody in September. Um, so there were so many places that the case was dropped. So I, I don't really have any hope that they'll do anything with the 30-year anniversary. But what I, what I hope for is the true crime community to take off with it and to those web sleuths and armchair detectives, like for them to all come together and, and help because it, it takes a village and nobody, nobody on the law enforcement side is helping. So it would be great if people who are trying to look for people that have no voice to give them a voice. Yeah, and I noticed you've been you've had a lot of help from the true crime community. I think uh, you know, in my opinion, one of the best podcasts out there on missing persons. I think it's the Vanish did a, a series on your mom, and that's that's amazing to see. Uh, I'm curious since you've started looking into your mom's case with this other person since 2017. Is there any information you've uncovered that you can share that might help this community uh, in looking at leads on, on what it might happen to your mother? Like, are there any specific details or an incident or anything that at all that, that might help people listening um, get started on, on trying to help you out? Um, the only thing that was new information was that my whole life I was told that she went missing in May of 94. And it wasn't until we pulled the police records that we found out she was in custody in September of 94. Um, and then that was actually her last disappearance or her last seen date. Um, but there's been no new information aside from that. Um, I mean, there has been that Gabby has spoken to Keiko and he, he claims he last saw my mom in like 1989 on the corner with Cruz. 
Um, my mom and I did not live in Las Vegas in 1989, so he was lying. Um, and whether he had the dates mixed up or what, it was not 1989. But then um, Gabby also spoke with Cruz, and he said he had no idea who my mom was and denied all of it. But we found out that he got married again, and uh, marriage certificates are public record. We were able to match his signature from his marriage certificate with the new person to my mom, and it's the same signature. So he's denying ever even knowing her when it's it's public information. So that's sketchy as well. So that's that's really it. But unfortunately, there's there's no new information. How has this entire ordeal affected you in your life? I mean, I, I imagine it's got to be very difficult to to not only grow up without without your mother and not knowing what happened, but then you know to, to start digging into that case. Like, can you tell me how it? You know, how how do you manage that on a day to day basis? Um, it it goes through spurts. I it's fine. I mean, it, it's hard. Like. I have kids and my oldest son, he's 13. He's about to be 14. And oddly enough, it was a really hard time when he was seven and um, I was 30 because that was the age of my mom and I, uh, when, when I last saw her, when she disappeared. Um, and it was just, it was mind blowing to me that I, I could never imagine leaving my child. Um, and now I have a two-year-old as well and it's, they will never know my mom. And the weird part is, is I, I keep it, it's like a different world, but I keep separate from my children. Like my oldest son knows about her, but he doesn't call her like, oh, my grandma. Um, he, he just calls his grandma, his paternal grandma, grandma. And then my mom is like, he'll say, oh, your mom, this, this, and this. So it's very, like, at arm's reach. But there are periods where it affects me, like, um, in September um, on her birthday. Those those are two times. Sometimes when I do interviews, um, I I get choked up. Um, the last one I, I did with the news I had a little bit of a hard time for that because they were asking me how I felt about someone else's 30 year old cold case being solved. And it just kind of broke my heart and I was happy for this other person, but it just kind of broke me because I, I feel like why can't my mom's be solved? Because these people are going to start dying off soon, uh, old age, lifestyle habits, whatever. And there's no one working this and pretty soon they're going to be gone. And so are all the answers. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, a lot of therapy. So it's, it's pretty, it's not that it's easy to go through, but it's the hand I was dealt and I've, I've learned the coping mechanisms of how to handle it and how to work through it and not let it, affect me daily really much at all that's incredible and you know i i want to thank you for doing this and talking to me i know it can't be easy on a final note uh we kind of hinted at this earlier how people can help you but i'm I'm curious like what's the ultimate thing someone listening can do right now who may have not heard of your mom's case before that wants to help um you know what can they do to step in and help you and and find answers for you and and what happened to your mom share share it anywhere share it on instagram tiktok facebook like share your podcast share my mom's website share my mom's facebook uh, anything um any kind of attention we can get it gets the case more attention which maybe someday the police will be like all right let's open up this file and actually work it um because we don't have much time and so one single share somebody else can see it and who knows where it can go from there it was just sharing it that it's it's gotten to where it is now um 
I mean, at one point I had a, a pretty big production company reach out to me from um, a TV show on Paramount Plus. The um, the big wigs of, behind the TV show decided to not go with my mom's story because they said it was too old, which is unfortunate because I don't feel that it is because until all of those people are gone, there are still answers to be had. If you know anything about the disappearance of Camille Dotson, please call the Las Vegas Metro Police Department at 702-828-3111. If you want to get the latest updates on Camille's case, please visit the Facebook page and website that I've linked in the show notes. Ashley and her team are looking for any information about her mother and her time in Vegas from 1991 to 1994. Any information or recollections you may have would be really helpful to Ashley and her team. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so by signing up for Patreon or buying me a coffee. The Patreon is only $5 a month and you get early and ad-free episodes. If you don't want to spend any money to support the pod, I totally get it. If you can, please leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Thanks for listening to the Missing and Unexplained Podcast.